Today on Coding 101, we're continuing with Phil the Nap. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Coding 101 is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Coding 101 is brought to you by Mandrill. Mandrill is a scalable, reliable, and secure email infrastructure service trusted by more than 300,000 customers. Sign up at mandrill.com, promo code TWIT, and you'll receive 50,000 free email sends per month for your first six months of service. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code C101. Welcome to Coding 101. It's the Twitch show where we teach you all the secrets of the code monkey slash warrior. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit, and for the next 30 or so minutes, we're going to get you all learned up on the things that you need to know to become the greatest code warrior ever. Now, uh, we've had a couple of changes to the show, which we're going to talk about, but first I want to welcome longtime friend of the show, uh, great code warrior, Mr. Lou Moresca, senior software engineer over at Microsoft. Lou, thank you very much for coming back. Hey, Padre, thanks for having me back. Now, now we've had you on since since episode one of Coding 101. Actually, you were our very first Code Warrior, and so it, it's fitting that you're here for some of the changes that are happening with the show. L let's talk about. It. Let's be completely open about it. We've decided to go in a different direction with Coding 101. What we found out was that uh, well, people were starting to lose interest with the whole reset to zero every time we switched to a different language. And so we sat down. And a, a bunch of us said, "Well, how how can we make this better? How can we keep people interested?" And what we decided was to make Coding 101 focus on projects rather than lessons and on the interesting people within the coding world rather than just the same basic topics over and over again. Now, that doesn't mean that we're done with teaching. It doesn't mean that we're going to get rid of all the cool little tidbits that you need to know about coding behind the scenes. But what it does mean is that we'll be able to have more interesting experts, more interesting guests who will, will show us their pet projects and then teach us how they did them. Uh, now, uh, thankfully, we've got Lou Maresca because Lou is actually going to help us with this transition by finishing up our four-part build an app project. Lou, uh, are you on board with that? Uh, I'm totally on board. Ready to go. Ready to go. Uh, be yep. Before we go, though, could we spend a little bit of time addressing one of the questions that some of our audience members have had? Sure, definitely. Let's do it. All right. Well, one of the things that has been asked over and over again, and we've, we've never quite gotten around to answering this, are uh, from, from fans, from audience members who have asked about uh, boot camps and coder academies. You, you've heard about these, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a ton of them. Yeah. I, and actually, there's a lot in Seattle, of course. It's, it's Redmond. It's near Microsoft. But the idea is you have some sort of super intensive uh, one week, two weeks, six week, 12 week, 24 week long boot camp where you sit and you learn a language. Now, our audience has wanted to know what, what we think about them and specifically what ones might we recommend if they wanted to get into coding, into programming. Uh, on Coding 101, we've been very open since the very first episode that we will never be able to give you everything you need to be that, that super excellent programmer. We just wanted to get people interested in uh, knowing what happens behind the scenes in their favorite piece of software. So, uh, uh, Lou, let me turn this over to you. What are your first impressions about, say, a coder academy or a boot camp? Well, to be honest with you, they're they're not really necessarily for everyone. Um, I mean, I take classes even here at Microsoft. We offer classes internally where we call them kind of coding academies or prim primers to actually um, developing different types of solutions. Like I, I took one on TypeScript a while ago, and those types of things they're they're very quick and they're very fast and very deep, um, and you can take them and you'll learn a lot. Um, but sometimes you don't necessarily learn the experience of actually doing. And I think that's really the key to programming is it you can learn how to do the language. I could probably learn French, but would I speak French really well? Probably not. Uh, I could probably get a lot get by by you know hearing things, but speaking it sometimes is a little tougher. So I think the same thing with coding is academies are great. 
they'll teach you the language, they'll teach you the concepts, the semantics, the syntax. But to actually code well with them, you have to do and you have to do well. So that's kind of what Coding 101 was, is all about is kind of doing, using what we kind of show and doing things with it over a long period of time. Right. It's a, the whole sampler approach. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed about a lot of the coding academies is, of course, they're of differing qualities, but they all teach the same thing. I mean, as long as they've got a decent reputation, they probably have a good staff, they probably have a good pedagogy, so they'll be able to take you through the material. But unfortunately, nothing, nothing, no amount of intensive programming lessons, no amount of great teachers, no amount of good material will make up for lack of interest. Uh, and unfortunately, this is one of those things, this is why I've been so reluctant to answer this. And, and Lou, maybe you can speak to this. I, I know people who really wanted to get into programming because they saw it as a future or they saw it as something that they, they want to do as a career. But that's all they saw. They didn't necessarily have the passion for solving problems in a coding language. And I think those are the kind of people who a coding academy or a boot camp, and they can be really expensive, is is wasted. Have, have you seen that phenomenon at all? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the problem with these things is they don't they, they don't give you the kind of the meat of what is actually going to happen, what you actually can learn. And so, again, they just they kind of throw you into the deep end. They go they try to go through the basics in the beginning, but then they will kind of take you really fast, really far. And so really far, really fast. So it's it's kind of tough to kind of get the gist of everything. Yeah, yeah. Now, I did want to give a plug for some of my favorite programs. These are these are programs that I've actually had firsthand experience of. I've seen their curriculum. Uh, the first one is they've got programs here in San Francisco. I think they've got Denver. They may have Seattle. I can't quite remember. It's uh, done by Galvanize. It's their G School Boot Camp. Now, this thing runs 24 weeks, so, of course, it's for the long haul. Uh, but it is an immersive full-time program or a part-time workshop, depending on how you want to run it. And they'll take you through the, the full development process. Basically, what we've done here on Coding One, they'll show you how to break problems down into programming languages, how to take those problems and, and break them into even smaller pieces that can be coded. And then they'll take you through some of the languages that are popular. Uh, I, I like Galvanize because it's like an all-you-can-eat buffet. They've got so <laughs> many resources, and you get to choose what it is that you want to learn during the boot camp. It's, it's, it's a pretty good one. Uh, another one that I like is Full Stack. Now, this is more about, this is a, a shorter program. It's only 13 weeks long, uh, which is still quite long, but it's, it's the same thing. You sit down with other like-minded people, you find your skill level, and then follow along till you can build something. Uh, now, uh, the, the thing, the warning that I have about Full Stack is I, I know a few people who have gone through the program. Some of them say it was exactly what they needed. It is exactly what they wanted. Uh, if you if you don't have the passion, you can really easily get lost in that program and just kind of just end up wasting your money. Uh, the last one, and actually, I think we had these folks either on All About Android or on Floss. I have to go back to the episodes list and find out, but it's called the Big Nerd Ranch. This is a super intensive, on location, one week crash course. Uh, and, and what I like about it is that they have they have the secret sauce. They have the thing that I really like. They realize it's not just about teaching you programming; it's about getting you networked. It's about getting you into the into the programmer culture. Um, and think of it as sort of like the, a hippie camp. For people who want to who want to program, uh, Alu, did you, did you have any recommendations? Do you know of any camps that uh, that you could throw your support behind? So there's a there's one called Base Camp, and it's here in Seattle, and it does it's a much shorter one, but it it just basically goes through the basics. That's why I call it, I call it Base Camp. You can I'm not sure what the website is. I'll have to look it up. We can put it in the show notes, but it's called like you can find specific ones for like iOS or C Sharp or. And they do base camps, and they're usually three to four days, and they they go through the basics, the fundamentals, uh, and they you know they actually provide you with VMs and virtual images you can load up in VirtualBox or something, and you can test things out. So that one's a good one too. Um, that one's that I have personal experience with, but all of these other ones are great too. I've actually looked through their sites and their content, and they seem pretty good. Yeah. Now, over the last couple of weeks, uh, Lou has been taking us through a four-part build an app series. The idea is to go from concept to finished product, something that we could actually install on our devices. Uh, we have already talked about the logic tree. We've talked about how we uh, we break down the features of our app, what we want it to do, and, and how it would actually do that, how it progress through the logic. We've talked a little bit about the model, like how would we actually process the data? How would we get it into the program? How would we decide what it needs to go to the user? And how would we decide what the user does to interact with that data? 
Today, we're going to talk all about binding. We touched on it last week, but we didn't get into it deep enough. Lou is going to show us how you bind your data so that a user can properly interact with the software and the software can properly interact with the user. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a break and talk about the first sponsor of Coding 101. Now, if you've been following tech like I have, you know that social is all the rage. It's always about the latest app, always about the latest service, always about the latest company that comes up with the newest, latest, and greatest way to blah, 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 blah. But through all that noise, there has been one constant for business and for developers. And that is the number one best way to communicate has always been email. And we've got Mandrill to talk about the fastest way to, del to deliver that email. Now, what is Mandrill? Well, it's the easiest way to manage, integrate, deliver, track, and analyze your email. It sports detailed delivery reports, advanced analytics, and a friendly interface that makes it easy for your entire team, from developers to marketers, to monitor and evaluate email performance across your business. Oh, you can use Mandrill to send automated one-to-one -one emails like password sets and, and welcome messages. That takes away some of the work that your IT group has to do. And it can also do marketing emails and customized newsletters. Mandrill started as an idea back in 2010, and now they're the largest email-as-a-service platform on the market. Because they've geolocated their servers to maximize response time, Mandrill can deliver your email in milliseconds, no longer waiting for hours or even days for really messed up networks to, to, to get to every corner of the company. And they've given you the webhooks and the analytics that developers need to check delivery rates and the documentation to make that integration a breeze. Now, speaking of integration, Mandrill is easy to set up and integrate with your existing apps. It comes with a beautiful interface, flexible template options, customized tagging, and advanced tracking and reports. And Mandrill is the only email infrastructure service with a mobile app that lets you monitor delivery and troubleshoot from wherever you are. Oh, Mandrill is powerful, scalable, and affordable, but you know what? You don't have to take our word for it. Right now, Mandrill is offering a special deal to members of the Twit audience. Sign up at mandrill.com today promo code TWIT, and you'll receive 50,000 free email sends per month for your first six months of service. That's M-A-N-D-R-I-L-L dot com, promo code TWIT. And we thank Mandrill for their support of Coding 101. Now, back to the action, Lou. When we last left our, uh, our wonderful audience here for Coding 101, we were just getting into data binding. Now, give us a refresher course. What is data binding and why do I need it? You bet. So like what basically what data mining is, it's the concept of like what we call a source and a target. So like for instance, I have a source of data somewhere and I need to target it to go somewhere. And so that's kind of like what data binding is. You take data from some source, let's say our model, in our case, some web service like Google API, and then we're going to target it somewhere and we're going to push it and actually show up that data to the view, to the user. And so the way we do that is we use what we call a one-way binding or a read binding. And that allows us to target specific fields, let's say a text box or a label or, or something like that on the view. And so it's, it's kind of a, a way to kind of target things. And there's things what we call a two-way binding too, where you can take data from your model, your, your API. You can then show it or target it to the user, and then the user can change some of that data, let's say a title or a name or something, and then they can hit save or they can just tab off that field, and then an action happens, and that binding, that data binding then targets again back to the model to say, hey, go save this data. So it's basically what we call a, a source and target kind of mechanism. Uh, I'll go, I, I've, got, I've got to ask a question because there's going to be someone out there who asks, which is, We've been talking about this MVVM, the model view view model model of programming, this idea that you have one component that reaches out into the world, gets all the data. You have one component that turns that data into something usable and presents it to the user. And then the view model, which actually, oh, the view module that actually takes that information and presents it in a usable format to the user and then communicates back to the view model what needs to be seen. Why wouldn't I just bind back to that module? That, that first module, uh, they'd say, look, why can't I just skip the middleman and just have a two-way communication rather than this sort of triangulated view of how the interface works? So there's, there's lots of reasons. One of them is basically so you can have kind of a middle tier to basically do things like test. And so like, for instance, if I have a failure in a call to the API, the user won't actually see that failure. Like we can do something to the data, maybe return empty data or something like that. Or we return a message back to the user to say, hey, this didn't work or something like that. So you're, you're kind of having a middle way, 
middle area to kind of handle things like that. Uh, another thing is, so you don't want to necessarily di bind directly to your model because your model might not really understand how to communicate to a view. So you'd have to put a whole bunch of logic in that model that doesn't really make sense to basically communicate information and you know translation, all that stuff back to your view, to your user, to use your UI. And so that becomes it makes the program a lot more complex, a lot harder to test, and a lot harder to find problems. That's kind of the key is the problems finding stuff. So when you create a view model, it simplifies that because now you have a middleman to kind of handle and buffer any of that issue, any of those issues that come arise. Anything you need to test, you can just test that one little sliver uh, of the set, of the of the program. And then also anytime you want to translate, you know, something coming back from the model, maybe it comes in a specific form. The model doesn't have to do that work. The view model can say, oh, I'll handle it for the view. You just do what you know how to do, which is get the data for me. And so that's kind of the key to the view model. Right, right. Uh, one of the things that, that I was taught uh, by people who were you know, trying to teach me the, the, the uh, view model model was that you programmed with the console. And the reason why you would program with the console, at least the reason why I would program with the console, is because it gave me better insight, better view into what was happening. I could, I could have all the errors show up. I could have all the compile issues actually be spelled out on screen. Uh, and then I could switch it to a nice, neat interface later on when I actually wanted to push it out. It, it, is that something that you do, or do you just go straight to the nice UI? <laughs> so yeah, that's a great question. So I think so there's two ways to do it, and there's, there's, a, there's a religious where I guess you could say from that aspect of programming is I like to do it in two different ways. One, you can either do the console way of doing it, where you basically hook up a simple console, which I think we did with the original task um, mm -hmm. application that we built. Or there's another way where and most uh, platforms allow this, like in Android or even in iOS and Windows, they offer what they call unit test uh, projects. And unit test projects are basically the whole concept of what we call test-driven development. And that means that you build a whole bunch of tests that will initially fail up front. Like for instance, I write a test to get a list of tasks and I expect that there's 10 items in that list and I write a test for that. The test when you run it will fail because the code doesn't actually do that yet. And then I actually go over to my view, my view model, and I write code to return 10 tasks. And then that test starts to succeed. And so the whole idea is you build a whole bunch of tests around the things that you want the app to do. They, they start to succeed as you build up that app. And then you can add more tests around different functional components. And then the cool thing about that is later on, as you more, change more code and it becomes more complex, you can, you can continue to run the same test over and over again. And then if one fails, you can say, oh, I, f I must have broke something. Let me go back and figure out why this unit test is now failing. And so that's kind of the key. And it's really easy to just add a unit test project to your application. It makes it easy. But console apps work too for especially smaller apps. When you get bigger, the unit test kind of works a little bit better. All right. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I've always found a little fascinating was the, the, in the Microsoft, in the uh, MVVM model, the binding, the data binding, is intended to be bidirectional. So you've got the UI, the view, which is communicating in both ways with the view model, which is also communicating both ways with the model. There have been some programs I've seen that have been basically been one way or very limited bidirectional communication. In other words, it's a status screen. So the status screen shows whatever it is that the view model pushes to it. Uh, but in, in Microsoft's view of how this should work, it should always be di bidirectional and it should always be richly bidirectional, right? So, so yes, I, I think that's kind of the way that they, so in, when you set up a, uh, a binding, you can specify whether it's one way or two way or which way it is. And I think the concept is, yes, they really do want you to kind of reutilize the two way kind of thing. But if let's say you were writing, you were writing an app that pulled down news information from a site and you just were getting the news content or the text from the news. You don't necessarily want a user to, to change that text. So you're going to show them a text box, but it's going to be a kind of a one-way binding. The data coming from the, the news site is just going to be a one-way read-only type thing. And so the platform allows you to do that. But normally, yeah, they want a more interactive type app. So everything, the concept, the modeling that they want you to do, the design they want you to use in your application is it's a kind of a two-way street, so to speak. And so it makes it more interactive that way. Okay, now we know what data binding is. Now we know why it should be bi bidirectional. And I'm hoping that uh, you're going to be able to actually show us some code that makes all this possible. Is, 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 is this what's coming up? Yeah, let's do that. That's okay, great. well, before that, though, let's go ahead and thank the second sponsor of this show so that we can continue uninterrupted through all the coding. And, of course, 
it's got to be Squarespace. Oh, anytime you need to get an idea out to the public, anytime you need to push out that, that newest website, that newest portfolio, you, you're going to have to think about what you want to spend your energy on. It's not just about money. It's about your time. It's about your resources. It's about your thought processes. Now, you could get yourself a, a back end. You could find a host. You could get someone that will get you the right domain. Or you could go to one place and have them do everything for you. That's what Squarespace is, the all-in-one platform that makes it easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. Now, I I've been using Squarespace because I need to give this wonderful tool of the Internet to a lot of my organizations that aren't that tech savvy. They don't have people who understand how websites work. They just have people who make content. And that's what Squarespace is for. People who just want to create and uh, leave all the programming to somebody else. Now, they're constantly improving their platform. They've always got new features, new designs, and even better support. They've got 25 beautiful templates for you to start with, with a recently added logo creator tool that allows you to create your online identity really simply and, and you know, for free. They've also got a very easy to use interface. It's, it's incredibly easy to use, but if you need help, they've always got help just a chat away, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Plus, there's a completely redesigned customer help site for easier access to self-help articles and video workshops. Now, Squarespace will give you e-commerce available with all their subscription plans, including the ability to accept donations, which is great for nonprofits, for cash wedding registries, and for school fund drives. And at just $8 a month, for everything, it's not going to break the bank. This new Squarespace metric app for iPhone and iPad also allows you to check site stats like page views, unique visitors, and social media follows. That means you always know how your content is performing. And if you sign up for a year, you get a free domain. And with the blog app, you can make text updates, tap and drag images to change layouts, and monitor comments on the go. It's, it's really that simple. Oh, even their code is beautiful. I mean, we're, we're a coding show. We, we care about what goes on behind the beautiful veneer. And if you look at the code that Squarespace provides you that builds automatically around your content, you'll see that they pay attention to detail. Uh, hosting is included, so they'll take care of it. You don't have to worry about who's going to host your pages or whether or not you're up to the bill. As long as you're paying your one subscription fee, they'll host it and they'll make it beautiful for all the devices that access it. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to start a free two-week trial with no credit card required. Start building your website today. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code C101 to get 10% off and to show your support for Coding 101. We thank Squarespace for their support of Coding 101. A better web awaits, and it starts with your new Squarespace website. Lou, take us home, brother. How do we do this binding? What does the code actually look like? You bet. So uh, if you guys show me your screen real quick, I'll show you. Um, so we talked about a, a while back the concept of like what we call a view model. And so I think in our original app, we built a task. So let me uh, make shrink this up so we can kind of see it. Um, we built a task class, task manager class that was able to do a couple things. One was able to get a list of tasks and it was able to get a list of lists and authenticate itself and then and then be able to return that list. Then, um, so that's kind of what we call our, our model, I guess you can say in that case, because that's accessing the Google API and then it's returning that data to the user. Right, so this is but, that, that third piece of the, of the MVVM model. So all this is doing is this is reaching out to the internet, grabbing the data and pulling it back in, in whatever format it comes. That's right, and in this case, I'm, I'm then like transforming it into just a standard concept in C-sharp called a list. And again, that's using the Google API task, what we call it, the task class or task object and that gets a list back but then I have to find out a way to basically send that over to the view the view needs to understand what that is and that that user experience so I built a little wrapper called the task manager view model and it has a couple things and really the the main ones we want to pay attention to here is the the public ones here the ones that are visible to the to the view and so I have what we call an observable collection and that means it's a collection or a list of things that then anytime anything changes in that list, whether it's an added or a removed item from that list, it will send out an event, a property change event. And that's where then the view listens to that event and says, oh, there's a new item in this list. I need to, I need to show it to the user. And so I have two of them. I have one for tasks and one for task lists. So I have two different observable collections. And you'll see in a second, I'm going to actually hook the UI up to it. And so anytime I add items to that, 
it will make them aware using what they call a property changed event and it will make them the you view aware that it needs to go and re-render itself or refresh itself so that it can show you or repaint itself so you can show you what it looks like now, now Lou, this is interesting so you're telling me that the view is actively listening to the view model to find out if something has changed uh, is there a way to do it the other way can, can you push out changes from the view model to the view make the view more passive so yeah, you could, there is a way of doing that. That's again another camp of way of doing things where you basically, it's a, there's a concept called the visitor pattern where you basically, you pass the view to the view model and then the view model hooks itself up to the view and then, then from there on out, anything that the view d needs to do, it can just automatically access the view models, events and, and stuff like that. And the same thing with the view model, it can access the view. So you basically pass, you would basically send in here like if I had an an item page uh, object or something like that. I would pass that item page in here and then I would store it and then I would hook up any of the events in here that change the view model and it would let the item page know that it's changed. So there's a way of doing that too if you wanted to do it that way. Oh, why wouldn't you do it that way? Because it sounds you're like you're collapsing the view and the view model. Yes. So th by doing this way, you're basically decoupling the two, breaking, breaking that bind, breaking that kind of the, the strong coupling that you would have if you had done that so like for instance i don't have to pass the view model doesn't have to know about the view and the view in the at all the view has to know about the view model but the view model doesn't know have to know about the view and that's kind of the key is when you're testing this now if i were to test just the view model i could run a whole bunch of tests to make sure that the lists were repopulating correctly but i wouldn't have to worry about the view at all i wouldn't have to load up my emulator for android or my emulator for windows phone and make sure that the view is showing up correctly this I could just test this by itself. So by making sure that the view model doesn't know about the view, it kind of isolates it in that, right. in that sense. Got it. And, and so in other words, again, yes, you could do it that way, and you could make it so that you, the, the view is a little less complicated. It doesn't have to actively call back. But then you're breaking that MVVM usefulness, which is if I if I design the first two modules right, the, the model and the view model, the, the view, the interface, could be anything, and I don't have to change. That's right. Okay. Yeah, and I think the, the key here is it, it gets a little confusing. So, I mean, obviously ask questions on, the, on Google Plus if you guys have questions or even in the chat room. I think one of the things that it's confusing is, like you said, is the view knows about the view model and the view model knows about the model. But it's never the other way around. It's never the model understands the view model and the view model understands the view. It's always that one way understanding of things. And so that makes it so everything's kind of decoupled in that sense. Yes, the view, in order for it to show stuff, has to access the view model. But for the view model to operate, it only needs the model. And so that's kind of the key is when you're, when you're building these types of apps. Fantastic. All right. All right. Take me through it. Okay. So if we pop, let's pop over to the actual, uh, what we call our view. And so this is, um, there's different views. I built as just a standard uh, application that you can build from Windows Phone. And it basically has these uh, pretty much blank sections. But if you kind of see, if I zoom out here a little bit, we can kind of see the the outline of the Windows Phone here, um, and I basically built a simple app. I just chose a hub app, a universal app, and these are just the standard um, stuff that comes along with it. So it's called a hub page um, because it actually looks like a hub on the inside, uh, like where you can basically pin stuff. Um, and so what I what I'm going to show you is actually just really quick how to bind things. Uh, I'm going to bind it to my uh, my list object, my ob my ob observable collection. So this looks very complex because there's a lot of markup here. There's a lot of, uh, but I'm going to try to make it real a little bit smaller for us here, so we can kind of see uh, just what I'm actually doing. So this is the page markup, and in there there's a grid, and then there's a hub, and each hub has a section. And so in your, if you ever used a Windows Phone app or Android app, when you swipe left or right, there's what we call a panorama view, and they have different hubs and different things in that hub. So in this case, I'm going to mess with the first hub section here. And um, I need to make sure that I can bind to that view model. So the first thing I need to do is set up a data context for the page. And so you'll notice here, I've actually added up here a little namespace that says, hey, go look at my, uh, my the, the assembly and the namespace. So if we pop over the view model, the, the namespace and the assembly that it's in. And in this case, it's in this little portable uh, DLL that I built, this PCL file that I built, and it's in that namespace, and it's called the task manager view model. So if I pop back over to the hub, I'm going to say, hey, go go look at this namespace inside this DLL, inside this assembly, and then set up a data, what we call a data context, and this means 
the data that I'm going to get is uh, coming Lou, from that. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm going to stop yep. you. Could you zoom yep. in a bit because some of our yeah, audience are small, small. Yeah, a little small. There okay. we go. All right. So the whole idea is data context is just, hey, where am I going to get the data from? Where, what, what's going to be my source of my data for this page? And so I'm going to say page data context is using the namespace task, which is from you know what we already set up here. We declared that. And then I'm going to look at the task manager view model. And so now what happens is as soon as this actually builds and shows, it, it will actually create an instance of that task view model. And so it'll call into this the default constructor and it'll create an instance of this and it'll just kind of stand and be, be ready for me to use it. And so then um, I can basically build inside the hub to say when I the first time I initialize, the first thing I want to do is I want to go set up the data context and make sure that I get all the data from the view model and set it up and, and bind it to the view. And so that's kind of the key is the view knows about the view model, but the model doesn't know about the view. And so now what will happen is when it loads up, it'll, it'll initialize that view model. But now I need to actually say, hey, I want to actually list my tasks. And so the way to do that is I need to bind some kind of you know, UI element, whether it be a list box or something, so that it will show it. And so I'll pop over to the hub here again. And I actually have a hub section where I can actually create for the list view, it's just a list of items, I can bind to basically a, a the, the, the list of tasks that I have. And so if I look down in here, I have a tasks block and a text block, and that text block is going to bind to the title of my, um, of my tasks here. And so if I pop back up here, I have data context again on that ta list view, and I say I'm gonna wa I want to bind to the task lists, and again, pop back over here. Task lists uh, right here. This guy, right, big guy right here. It's public observable collection. I want to bind to that. And for each item in that list, I want to bind to the title. And so if we, again, pop over and we look inside a task list, um, I go to the de de declaration right. here. It has a property called title. Oh, so Lou, well, we've got some people in the chat room who are kind of, they're freaking out. They're like, oh my God, what's going on? I thought this was coding 101. And I, <laughs> I, I will say, all of this code is going to be available. We we make we bundle it up as a zip yeah. file so that you can download it. Yeah. I understand you're not going to be able to write this from scratch unless you're already an expert programmer, which means you probably wouldn't be watching us. Don't worry about that. What we're trying to do is to get you to understand this concept of binding. What Lou has been showing you is how you can bind the view model to the model. So remember, the model is the part that's getting all this data in from Google. It's just putting it right. into a big list. The view model is binding lists within itself to those lists within the model so that it can bring it over and turn it into some sort of usable information. Then the view binds itself to the lists that the, mod the view model has made. Uh, in other words, that the, the usable information. So imagine it if you've got three parts, that third part, the model, the outside part, the, the liaison between the outside world is connected to the middle part. The middle part is doing some mojo. It's doing the business logic, the magic. And once it's done with that, it's bound to the view. So there's this three-way communication. The view doesn't know the model. The model doesn't know the view, but they both see the view model. That's what Lou is trying to show you. You're going to have all the code, so you don't, have to, you don't have to know how to program it, but just try to figure, picture it in your mind what's happening, because that's the important part. That's right. And so one of the key things is, again, data context, data binding, these things are really large concepts and they and they could take probably five or six uh, instances of the show for us to kind of figure it all out. The concept here, though, is when you you basically have to set up a source of data on the view and then you bind to that source of data, each element, each UI element. So when you're building up a view, we really didn't go into XAML and how to build a view. So and that again, that could be another session entirely. But when you build an app for the first time, they give you kind of a default view, and then you can kind of just throw a text box or something on there and then learn how to data bind. And so that's kind of what I did as I took the default view, and then I have a list box, and I'm just going to kind of bind to my view model so that I have all the task list names listed out in there. And we kind of showed that in another version of an app that we had. I think it was the podcast catcher. Right. We go went and got the XML, and then we binded to that. So that was kind of a very similar concept. Right, and remember, you could just go back a couple of episodes and you could see that happening, where if the RSS feed changed, what showed up in the view changed. And it didn't have to go, the view itself did not go back out to the outside world. It was the model that was getting that information, turning it into something that the view model 
could could understand, uh, which was the actual podcast itself, which then pushed it over to the view. So again, it's concepts, 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 concepts. Pay attention to the concepts because we're going to give you the code. All right, Lou, uh, we're running really close here. So, so what are the other things that they, they need to understand about how you've bound this data between the three modules? So there's there's lots of different concepts. I mean, for one thing is like there's the concept of data data provider or data context, and then there's other concepts around static resources. And so go look those up because those are important too. And that means that like static resources, you can create classes that are static that are always there, and then you can kind of pump data into them, and then the the view will then listen to them. Or there's ways what we call instance contexts, or basically create instances of it, meaning every time the view needs something, it will make sure that there's an instance created of that class and it will go in and create an instance of it. There's also a great example, I think it was Joe that showed it in uh, in Google Plus where he said he had a view, he had a, a XAML file and it was actually um, bound to just like, a, I think it was an XML file or a JSON file and it was a showing a bunch of XML on the screen and it didn't have any view model or view or data, uh, view model or, da or model at all. It just was the model that was bound directly to the XML file. And the key here is that's what we call static binding because you can bind to that static file and then list that stuff. So those are some things you want to go look at is data context, static, static binding, static resources, and just understanding binding in general. And then once you kind of get that concept, you'll, it's really easy to kind of understand where you can kind of hook up the view model side, side of things. Fantastic. Uh, Lou, next week, we're actually going to be finishing up the Build Your Own app segment. Um, and, and this is actually a, a view of things to come. We want to give you projects. Now, within those projects, we may be covering multiple languages. So we will still show you how languages work. We will still show you basic concepts like MVVM and data binding. But we want to give it to you within the context of having something at the end that you can say, I did this. And we do still need one major piece before we can call this application closed. Lou, can you tell us a little, a little bit about next week and Xamarin? Yeah, you bet. So the whole idea behind Xamarin is you build what we call a universal app in uh, in Window in Visual Studio and or in Xamarin Studio, and then that app has some uh, what they call a universal or a, a portable last libraries that have all of your logic in it. And then you basically can load that up into Xamarin Studio and you can specify, hey, I want this for Android and I want this for iOS. And then Xamarin Studio, you can compile it right in there and actually build a quick little UI for all of them, or you can reuse what you have. And then it will actually pop up and emulate. Like for instance, Android, it'll just actually deploy it to Android and boom, all the logic you wrote in C Sharp will then show up and work inside the Android emulator. Really, really cool stuff. So get yourself, go to Xamarin.com um, and go get the Xamarin Studio install. And the cool thing is the project we've been showing, the, the last three projects we've shown you that were portable, the portable classes, I think the social one, the podcaster, um, and the task one, you can actually load them up in Xamarin Studio and then compile them and then there, we'll go through actually how to deploy them to an Android. Fantastic. Lou Maresca, Senior Software Developer with Microsoft. We thank you so very much for, uh, for being part of this show. I mean, seriously, you, it's, it's always a pleasure to have you on. Could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you, where they can find your work, and of course, they can find you on the Twit TV network. <laughs> of course. So, twit I'm so twitter.com slash Lou MM. Uh, and of course, uh, about me, that Lou Mem. And uh, you can always find my work on crm.dynamics.com. Lou Maresca, thank you very much. And we will see you next time. See you guys. Now, folks, that's the end of this episode of Coding 101. Uh, again, it's going to take us some time. Please bear with us as we switch our formats. Uh, it, it really is going to be more interesting. I know there's a lot of people who are upset that we're, we're moving away from the old format, but what we're really trying to do is to incorporate this idea of learning new languages, but give people something that they can actually walk away with. It's that takeaway. You, you want to be able to have that Raspberry Pi that you've, you've turned into something special, or that embedded controller that you can now play with, or that Arduino that you've, you've actually designed and programmed to work in the real world. These are the kind of projects that we're going to be giving you as we set up our guest slate. And I, I promise you, it's going to be interesting. Now, I, I will say this. If you're worried about where we're going, or if you want to give us your input, because this is a great time to give us input, I want to give you the opportunity to speak directly with me. Tomorrow at 5 o'clock p.m. Pacific time, that's 1700 uh, Eastern time, and 
can't even remember what that is in UDT. But I will be having a Google Hangout. Anyone is invited to come in and talk. If, if you want to get something off your mind, if you want to tell me how horrible I am, if you want to tell me how you want to see Coding 101 move in the future, that's the time where you can do it. And I'll sit there for an hour and listen to everything. And you know what? Maybe your idea is going to become part of the new Coding 101. Just make sure to go to our Google Plus group at Google uh, plus.google.com plus Twit Coding 101. Join the group. I'll be posting the invitation there. Join the discussion and help us create the next program for those who want to get into coding. Also, don't forget that you can find every episode of Coding 101 on our show page. Just go to twit.tv slash twitcoding101 or slash code and you'll be able to find every episode of Coding 101. If you want to check out any of our old modules, if you want to see our show notes, which is important because that's where we put the links so you can download the code packages and also the link to our GitHub for some of our older projects. If you, if you watch our show, make sure to go to the show notes page because you'll get all of the accompanying assets. It makes so much more sense if you already get the code right in front of you. As long as you're going to go there, why not follow me on Twitter? You can find me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. Again, that's a great place to tell me what you want to see for future episodes of Coding 101. In fact, just this morning, I had two people who, who gave me great names for future guests of the show. We're reaching out right now and asking them if they want to be uh, featured as an interviewee and also to give us a module or two of something that's in their specialty. Uh, finally, don't forget that we do this show live every Thursday at 1.30 Pacific time at live.twit.tv. If you watch, you can see us in our pre-show, in our show, and in the post-show. You get to see all the bloopers that we have to take out before we give you the final downloaded version. And don't forget that as long as you're going to be live, why not jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv. I've got you right down there. So if you've got questions or comments or just frustrations during the show, I can see you as we go along and it helps us to guide where we take every episode of Coding 101. Finally, I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, to Lisa, to Leo, to uh, to my super TD. Uh, I'm not sure if he has a camera on himself. Mr. Cranky Hippo himself, Brian Burnett. This is the view we normally get of him. Um, uh, sir, where can we find you on the Twit TV network? Well, I wasn't prepared for that toss. Uh, you can find me watching Know How, which is going to be on tonight at 7 o'clock with you. Uh, and also follow me on Twitter at uh, Cranky underscore Hippo. Fantastic. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballasare, the digital Jesuit. This has been Coding 101. End of line. <laughs>